Hey guys, it's Jim coming at you live from the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum uh, in the heart of Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan, New York City. This is another Adventures, uh, Intrepid Adventures live and free program. And if you'd like to uh, keep this free programming uh, flowing, please think about supporting us by clicking the link that you're going to see in the chat below. And also, please feel free to say hello. Tell us uh, your name, who you are, where you're tuning in from. Also, let us know if you've ever been to the, to the Intrepid Museum before. We have Jonathan working behind the scenes with us today. And today's program is called Journey to Space. So we're going to be taking a look at Intrepid's connection to uh, space exploration and beyond. But first, a little bit about the Intrepid. If you think you know what kind of ship the Intrepid was, please tell us in the in the chat. Now, if you take a look at the picture there, let me make it a little bigger for you. It could be quite uh, evident. That could be a hint for you. Um, it's pretty big. It carried stuff. Give you a couple more seconds. Three, two. One, if you said in your head, or we're going to about to write on the chat, it is an aircraft carrier, you are absolutely correct. Before it was a, a museum, it was an aircraft carrier. Now, Intrepid, um, of course, became a museum in 1982 when it was uh, retired and brought here to uh, the, uh, the Hudson River on the west side of Manhattan. But before that, the aircraft, uh, sorry, the, the museum, the Intrepid, uh, served in World War II. It was commissioned in uh, 1943. In fact, it's about to, to celebrate its 78th birthday on August 16th of this year. It would be decommissioned, it would serve throughout the, the World War II, through the Cold War and the Vietnam War as well. It will be decommissioned in 1974 and, of course, becoming a museum here uh, in 1982. Now, it's pretty big. It is pretty big. Yes, hi, Elise. I see you there. Um, if you took a trepid and stood it up on its bow or on its stern, you can, uh, you can see that it will be almost as tall as uh, the Chrysler Building. The Chrysler Building, another important landmark here in Manhattan. It's about 1,042 feet tall. The Intrepid would be 913 feet tall. So there you go, it'd be pretty big. And World War II was about 845 feet tall. Uh, as you see there in the picture, um, from, uh, from the bottom of its uh, hull to the top of the, uh, the island, which is the, the structure with the antennas on the top, it's about eight stories tall. Now, um, going back to this picture here, it might uh, definitely gives you a hint there that it was an aircraft carrier. Now, what was it? used for? Why have an aircraft carrier? Tell me in the chat real quick. Why have an aircraft carrier at all? Why not just take all the aircraft we need, fly them from bases from in the United States or anywhere else to where they were needed in the field or during wartime or on their mission? Any hints at all? You can take a look at those aircraft carrier on uh, those aircraft that are on the deck of the Intrepid in that picture from World War II. If you were thinking, well, planes back then couldn't fly across the river, then that uh, the river, the ocean, and that is exactly what uh, the reason for having an aircraft carrier. Aircraft carriers are uh, floating airports, and absolutely everything we have on land-based airports, we we have especially today, but even back as far as World War II when the Intrepid was serving, um, we have them all on those aircraft carriers as well. Okay. Now, how many aircraft do you think were on board Intrepid? If you have any guess at all, this might give you a hint in this picture right here. Let me make it a little bigger for you guys. How many aircraft do you think? Uh, I can see many of you guys probably counting the aircraft on the pictures right uh, in the picture. Well, in World War II, the Intrepid had between uh, 85 and 100 aircraft. Uh, during its time in Cold War, that went down a little bit as the planes tended to be a little bit heavier and a little bit bigger. And by the time it was in Vietnam, we had uh, right around 50 to 60 aircraft on board, and that included helicopters as well. Right. Okay, so we, uh, we know that uh, we are the Sea, Air, and Space Museum, and it's pretty easy to tell why the Intrepid would be a sea museum. 
Uh, it's also pretty easy, we just talked about aircraft, to realize um, why it was an air museum, but why is it a space museum? And that's really what we're gonna be talking about today. Right? The Intrepid had an important role to play in something called the Cold War, okay? The Cold War had many symptoms, um, some of which included the, the Korean War. The Vietnam War could absolutely be seen as a symptom of the Cold War. Um, but something more important, or something that we're going to, as far as this presentation, it's more important. We're going to talk about uh, the space race, okay? The space race. Now, real quick, down in the chat, what two countries played the most important role in the space race? Okay, that shouldn't be too difficult. One country you're probably in right now. The other country you may have visited, but actually isn't around anymore. It's called something else. So one of the countries, there you go, the good old USA. And the other country back then during the Cold War was the Soviet Union. There you go. Um, now known as Russia. Um, now, what was the goal of the space race? Yes, Samuel, you got it, the USSR, perfect. Um, now we call it the space race. I want you to imagine it as a race um, that you might be running or you might be driving in a race or other races that you see that you might have on the Olympic games that are coming up in about a, in about a week or so. When you're in a race, you're trying to get to the finish line, right? You're trying to, to reach a goal. What do you think the goal of the space race was? What was the goal of the space race? Again, put it in the chat. Yep, we're gonna put the Soviet Union back up there. Any ideas in the chat what it was? The goal of the space race. If you are thinking about becoming the first country to put people on the moon, you're absolutely correct, okay? To be the first, Samuel, to be the first on the moon, that is exactly correct. The space race is gonna begin on um, October 4th, 1957 with the launch of this. I'm gonna ask you to be interactive with me once again, folks, put down in the chat, what do you think that is? What was, what was that and what was the name of that? It was about the size of a beach ball. It's got four um, those metallic things coming off of it, kind of looked like antennas. In fact, that's what they were. They'll give you a hint to what it was. You got it, Samuel, one more time. You got it on the nose. That is Sputnik. Sputnik is a satellite. In fact, it was the first man-made object launched into orbit by the Soviet Union, okay? This is going to uh, cause uproar in the United States. In fact, it's going to get the U.S. government moving on its own space program. And not uh, too far after, it's going to put its first satellite, or we are going to put our first satellite in orbit, called Explorer 1. I kind of think Sputnik looks like a better satellite to me, but you can see what looked like tentacles coming off, which served as antennas on, on Explorer 1 as well. Another uh, result of, this, of the Sputnik launch is going to be the formation of NASA, okay, that we're all familiar with today. But uh, in, on April 12, 1961, the Soviet Union is going to take a tremendous step forward in the space race, and they're going to put the first person into space. Okay, if you remember what the name of the first person was in space, put it down there in the chat. You know what to do. Samuel, I'm counting on you. Um, he uh, is no longer around today, unfortunately. I don't think he was such a bad guy. Three, two, ah, there you go. I know I could count on you, Samuel. This guy right here, Yuri Gagarin. This is Soviet Air Force Lieutenant. Yuri Gagarin became the first person uh, it's first human being in orbit on April 12th, 1961. That, of course, is going to put another tiffy in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the U.S. government. Um, they're going to create their own group of astronauts. Now, honestly, they have been working on these guys since the late 50s as well, since about 1957, 1958 as well. These guys are known as the Mercury 7. And these guys uh, would be the first seven astronauts chosen by the United States. 
all these guys are going to have a, a uh, turn at going up into space in this. What is that? Tell me in the chat in the chat once again. What do you think that is? Kind of looks like it might be. It's in the shape of like a, a flashlight. You can you can picture a giant reaching down and grabbing the the left side of that, and maybe using it as a bell and ringing the bell. Any ideas what that is? You it's it's well it's not mercury, but yeah, it's the mercury capsule, right? There you go, Samuel. Very good. Um, now, Project Mercury is going to be the first step. You can call it the first leg in the race, OK? Races have legs sometimes. And it's going to be the first leg of the space race. OK, now what was Intrepid's role in this whole thing? Here we have the Mercury 7 astronauts once again. Um, Intrepid is going to play a vital role as a recovery vessel for that guy. Whoops. We're going to put it back there and let's go back. There you go. That guy with the red circle around his head is Scott Carpenter. Scott Carpenter is going to be the second American to orbit the planet. Um, he's going to go around about three times. It's going to be a little less than five hours before he comes on down. Now, um, stories vary, but um, from either a malfunction in his equipment, he was paying too much attention to the view or he decided to take a little joyriding himself. See, these guys were the best pilots on the planet. They're all Navy, Air Force, one Marine aviator, um, but they never let them really fly these things. It was all computer controlled. They were always asking for more to do. Some stories say that Scott Carpenter took it upon himself to do a little piloting himself, but whatever happened, he came. He uh, started his re-entry into the atmosphere a little bit too late. And that is going to cause his mercury capsule here to re-enter the atmosphere and come down uh, 250 miles away from his target. Uh, it's a good thing uh, uh, that the area that he was coming down in was pretty big. Speaking of that, where do you think he came down? If you have any idea where he came down, please share it in the chat there as well. If anybody else is out there and willing besides Samuel, but Samuel, feel free to keep uh, uh, responding. Do you think the Mercury Project landed on land? Do you think somewhere softer maybe? Somewhere splashier? Maybe somewhere uh, like the ocean? There you go, right over there, right? The parachutes came out. It's gonna splash down in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, not too, too far away from Puerto Rico, all right? So here's Scott Carpenter one more time, putting on his, his, his spacesuit. He's going to be launched in the Atlas rocket you see on the picture to the left there. Um, and you see at the very top of there, you see some of the black area. Before you see what looks like a little rocket on top, right underneath that was the Mercury capsule. So that was uh, all out there, um, just uh, exposed to the elements. He's going to do that splash down 250 miles. The Intrepid is going to be the recovery vessel that is going to be tasked with coming to uh, pick up uh, Scott Carpenter and his capsule as well. Now, because of that 250 mile offshoot or overshoot, it's going to take us three hours, three hours to find this guy. No worries, though. Scott Carpenter is a Navy man. He's used to going up and down in the, in the waves. When we do find him, he is in his life raft. His feet up are kicked up on the side. Head, uh, hands back behind his head, just enjoying the Atlantic sunshine near Puerto Rico. And when we do find him, it's going to be picked up by a Navy helicopter launched from the Intrepid. Um, but one thing, though, guys, before, uh, because of the 250 mile distance uh, away from the target, um, the helicopter that we send to go pick up Scott Carpenter is going to be using too much fuel. So they're not going to be able to pick up the, the capsule. They're going to be able to pick up just uh, Scott Carpenter himself, as you see in the picture right there. The capsule will be picked up by a destroyer, which the name escapes me. If you guys know, put it down in the chat for me. All right. So uh, that is, so what did Scott Carpenter do, you think? What did he do up in, in, in orbit? What do you think? Did he just go along for the ride? It was less than five hours. Okay. Not a whole lot of time, but I'm sure he did get some great views. Um, Scott Carpenter is actually going to take a handheld camera along with him and is going to take some uh, photos and some videos of the, uh, of the Earth through his little window. 
He's going to actually be the first American astronaut to eat solid food while in orbit around the Earth. Uh, don't get too uh, uh, excited about the food. Uh, food had a long way to go, all right? He's using some little lozenges, which they are going to call meat lozenges, okay? And they're going to be coated with some kind of a gelatin just to keep, uh, just to keep it uh, together so it doesn't cause many uh, crumbs. But that uh, meat lozenge that he's going to be experimenting with by eating, it gets crushed under uh, under some um, it gets crushed under some equipment. So he's going to say, you know what? I'm going to go to Plan B. Plan B is a Plan B was simply a candy bar, but it got hot in the capsule. It's about 102 degrees in there. About the about. Uh, how hot it feels outside of, of the Intrepid right now in New York City. Uh, it's going to be melted. So he's going to open up the paper. He's going to take a bite. He's going to say, you know what, to, to Houston Control, I'm done with the, with the food experiments. And you can't really blame him for that. Okay. Whoops. Didn't want to go that far. We're going to stop and see if there's any questions here. If there's anybody who has any kind of any questions, we could see if we can answer those for you guys. Okay, so why was it called Project Mercury? Aha, good question. Okay, so this is actually going to be the beginning of a long history of NASA naming things after Roman uh, and Greek as well, gods. Okay, so Mercury. If you can remember from your Greek uh, uh, um, and Roman uh, mythology, Mercury was the messenger god, and he was supposed to be very, very fast. Okay, now I did tell you that uh, the the whole mission that Scott Carpenter took, the three orbits he made, was less than five hours. That's pretty fast, right? Mercury as a god, you may you may remember him with the wings on his helmet. He had wings on his boots as well, and maybe little wings on his back sometimes. So he was a fast guy. What else is fast? What else is named after Mercury in our solar system? If you're thinking of the first planet from the sun, you got it, okay? The first planet from the sun. And since it is the first planet, it tends to revolve around the sun at a fa much faster than any of the other planets. In fact, it takes only 88 days for it to go completely around the, the sun. It means its year is only 88 days long. So that was fast as well. So the whole concept of speed here kind of um, lent to that whole uh, naming of the first project of the first leg in our space race as Mercury. Good. Any other questions? Did Scott Carpenter leave the capsule? Ah, okay. So no, actually leaving the capsule and doing a spacewalk is actually about three years after Scott Carpenter's flight. Um, of course, you need to be uh, you need to be completely enclosed in your spacesuit. We're going to be actually talking a little bit more about that later on, as we go through the presentation. Um, it wouldn't be till American astronaut Ed White he would be the first American to to take a spacewalk. All right, so we're going to be about uh, three or four years away from uh, that time. Okay, great. The second leg, okay, so Mercury was the first leg in a race. We have a second leg. So now we've done all these basic things, okay? We've learned how to go up into space. We've learned how to orbit the planet. Um, we've learned how to come down uh, and do a splashdown, um, although maybe up to 250, uh, uh, 250 miles away. What's our second leg? Our second leg is going to involve these two guys here. Okay, and that's a hint as to what it was called, two guys. You got it, Samuel, Project Gemini with these two guys, the first guy on the left there. Let me bring it onto the screen so you guys can actually see it. There you go. That is Gus Grissom, Virgil Gus Grissom. He liked to be called Gus, Air Force uh, test pilot. And right next to him on the right there is John Young. He's another Navy guy, All right? Those guys went up in the Gemini capsule. Um, the first mission, Okay, well, we don't want to do that. Okay, so uh, Gemini 3, which is which was their mission, is going to be the first one to actually change orbit by using the capsule's rockets, okay, to change direction. Um, they're going to also go up around, uh, around the Earth three times as well. So also a little under five hours it's going to take them. They're going to be launched in a Titan rocket on March 23rd, 1965. 
Okay, so we're getting closer. Now, why do you think, guys, it was named Gemini? Some of you guys, uh, as to give you a hint, some of you guys may be called, uh, maybe a Gemini. Hmm. It may be a sign in a typical zodiac. If your birthday is somewhere around end of May, beginning of June, you may indeed be a Gemini, but it actually goes further than that. So this actually stems from a Greek myth. Um, it turns out there were two twins named Castor and Pollux. And if you can find the constellation Gemini at night, these stars that represent the heads of the two twins are those, Castor and Pollux. So it's because, it went, again, named after Greek mythology and because it had two astronauts uh, in it as well. So we talked a little bit about space food, guys. Check this out, okay? Um, it, it, it improved very little since Scott Carpenter ate his first meat lozenge, okay? Everything is dehydrated that they take up. Water is very heavy, so weight is always a consideration. Um, food was starting to be experimented with more and more here in the Gemini program. The, the foil wrapping kind of right in the center of that picture is a chicken sandwich. You have other things here called cinnamon toasties. And you see up at the kind of the top of the screen there, it's got a couple of tubes, looks like toothpaste tubes. That was where they had their orange juice in, okay? So yum, yum, space food. Now, again, everything is gonna be coated with that gelatin or an oily substance so it didn't cause crumbs. Um, you don't want crumbs uh, because crumbs uh, may float around here when we eat a sandwich, right guys? And if you cause crumbs, they're gonna fall down into your lap, maybe on the table. Maybe if you're lucky, you have a napkin to catch them. I know when I'm eating a sandwich, I usually like to eat on my couch and I'm gonna get crumbs everywhere. Although I try hard not to make crumbs, but it, it, it inevitably is gonna happen. Um, but in, in uh, orbit around the earth, if you, you eat a sandwich, the breadcrumbs are not gonna fall down. They're gonna be floating around all around you. Those crumbs are gonna be available to maybe go behind your instrument panel and start to um, uh, interfere with the equipment. They may get sucked into the air vents and clog things up. You may bring breathe them in and start to choke on little pieces of bread and things like that, so you don't want it. So that's why that gelatin coating and that oil coating uh, is put around all food. Uh, especially that we used back then. However, uh, the Gemini 3 has another uh, 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 very good story attached to it. So it seems that fellow Mercury 7 astronaut Wally Shira was a big prankster. And he, uh, before uh, Gus Grissom and John Young were gonna go up in Gemini 3, he slipped John Young a corned beef sandwich, okay, from Wolfie's down at uh, Cocoa Beach, Florida. Very famous, they're no longer around, but very famous uh, delicatessen. So John Young is going to take that corned beef sandwich and sneak it in his uh, spacesuit. So nobody connected with the project is going to see it. And while they're up in orbit, he takes it out and he says, hey, Gus, how about this? And he's like, where'd you get that? Anyway, it's much better than the food that you're looking at now on the screen. So they're going to uh, uh, take a bite out of it. They're each going to take a couple of bites. They're going to finish less than half of that sandwich um, until they see crumbs actually doing what I what I described before is floating around and he stows it back into his uh, spacesuit does john young they do their splashdown um and the people who come to examine the uh the uh capsule are going to find these crumbs and so the jig is up okay so actually john young and gus grissom are going to spend a lot of time in front of congress apologizing okay in fact congress is going to call it a 30 million dollar sandwich according to them it cost it cost the project $30 million to do uh, uh, exactly that, uh, to clean up everything, okay? So if you can't use bread in orbit, how are you gonna make a sandwich? Well, how about tortillas? And that's exactly what they're gonna do. Uh, this is a picture of, of Peggy Whitson with her hamburger on a tortilla. Hmm, does that look appetizing to you? I don't know, my friend Kara, who does this presentation as well, kind of thinks it looks appetizing. I'm not so sure. Uh, you can see it's got a little mustard on there. It's got some onions, maybe a little black beans in the middle there too as well. Uh, and she kind of hung it up there in uh, the microgravity so we could take a good look at it. But most importantly, guys, it's not going to cause uh, any crumbs. 
Peggy Whitson, oh, by the way, my favorite part of this picture, the Santa hat that's up in the left-hand corner there. You see that Santa hat? There you go. So uh, maybe maybe uh, around holiday time, this, this picture was being taken. Peggy Whitson uh, is, was the first female commander of the International Space Station, okay? She's actually the oldest woman ever to go into space at age 57. Uh, and she holds the record, male or female, for the most time uh, overall in space with all of her missions, 534 days, again, not continuously, but she holds that record, 534 days. Right? Now, guys, also up in, uh, up in space in the microgravity environment, things are going to happen. Uh, something is going to happen called the fluid shift. Now, if you were, uh, think about last time you had a cold and your head kind of gets all stuffed up. Right. In, in one of the things that astronauts have to deal with in a microgravity environment is exactly that, the fluid shift and their heads are kind of going to get stuffed up a little bit. Uh, and what happens when your head gets stuffed up when you have a cold? You don't have a great uh, sense of, of taste or smell, do you? Um, so astronauts constantly were, uh, were complaining about the lack of taste. And that's why astronauts uh, tend to enjoy spicy food. Spicy food tends to clear the uh, clear the uh, sinuses a little bit, um, and they can test it a little bit better. Yep, some of you got it. Inner ear, uh, all all that uh, congestion piles up in there. Okay, so uh, uh, here is their splashdown. Gemini three um, is going to splash down. This is going to be much easier for the Intrepid to pick up. Yes, the Intrepid was the recovery vessel for this mission as uh, as well. They're only going to come down 60 miles off course, okay? And because of that, uh, the Intrepid is going to be able to pick up both the uh, the two astronauts and uh, the capsule as well. And in this picture, you can see some of the Navy divers that, uh, that, that jumped out of the helicopter to help them. They're going to put that flotation collar, that yellow uh, piece that's around the Gemini capsule there. And they're going to be able to spot it much easier because of the green dye you see coming out of the front of the capsule there as well, that green dye that you see. Right? The Intrepid is going to use one of their cranes to crane the uh, the Gemini 3 capsule, which was named the Molly Brown in honor of the unsinkable Molly Brown, uh, a passenger on board uh, the Titanic who was a survivor of the Titanic disaster, named by Gus Grissom, who was the commander. They're going to bring that on board. And you can still see today a replica of that Gemini 3 capsule hanging from our crane if you come to see the Intrepid today. Very good. So we're going to take another break here, see if we have any questions. Any questions that you may have? Ooh, Samuel, maybe. Oh, do they eat better food in space now? Okay, excellent question. Um, yeah, they do. Um, the jury's out as far as I'm concerned as how good it actually still tastes, regardless of the fluid shift that's keeping their sense of taste down. Um, but it's absolutely, uh, uh, but I hear it's much better, okay? Um, today, routinely astronauts make their own sandwiches up on the ISS, the International Space Station, for example, like Peggy Whitson was doing with her hamburger. Um, just recently, a few months back, I believe it was in January, uh, one of their experiments at the uh, ISS was a microgravity oven, a baking oven. And they actually, one of their experiments was to cook cookies or to bake cookies in that oven. Uh, I bet you a lot of us would like to have ex uh, have experiments go on like that. I certainly would. I love cookies. Baked goods, that's what I'm all about. Um, it did bake the cookies, but it took two hours to make the cookies. So I don't know if you can call it a success. The cookies were a little bit less than done by the time they were finished, but they ate them anyway. But for sure, I think it made the compartment that they were cooking in smell really, really good. All right. Okay, good. So now we've got leg one finished with the Mercury program. We've got leg two, leg two finished with the, with the Gemini program. Leg three, right? Who can tell me, um, what the third leg of the space race was. Anybody just throw it down there in the, in the comments. Certainly at the beginning of the space race, the Soviets were winning this race. In fact, they had a huge lead over the United States. Um, the United States would catch up with the Gemini program, and then they're going to move ahead in this third leg program. Anybody have any idea? You got it, Sam. Thanks. 
it's the Apollo program, okay? And of course, these three guys here are, are the most famous Apollo astronauts from left to right from left to right, let me make that bigger for you guys, there you go. From left to right, it is uh, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. And here's a little hint, guys. We're not gonna talk too much about these guys. But if you tune in to see my program next Tuesday, we're gonna talk in great detail about these guys and the Apollo 11 program uh, in general, okay? Just a little hint for you there, tune in next Tuesday. Um, so the Apollo program is gonna have nine missions that went to the moon. It's going to have uh, it's going to land six astronauts on the moon that will actually take uh, walks, strolls along the moon. In all, tw uh, in all, twelve astronauts are going to walk on the moon. Okay, this is all built off of the baby steps. Remember the Mercury program, the baby steps. Let's first get a guy in space. Let's next get people in orbit around the moon. Uh, sorry, around the Earth. Then let's get uh, two astronauts to go up and do a lot of experiments. The Gemini program is going to uh, range from the duration of each mission is going to range from a little under five hours with the Gemini 3, which was the first manned uh, Gemini uh, mission, all the way to um, a Gemini mission that, uh, that spent two weeks in orbit around the planet. These were all about practicing the skills that were needed to uh, even attempt to go to the moon. All those 100% completed, it is uh, then on to the moon with the Apollo program. Okay, um, with the successful landing on the moon, guys, remember that was the finish line that effectively ended the, the, the space race and the United States, of course, won that one as well. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about life in space, okay? What do you guys know about living in space? Just put down there in the chat. Maybe you wanna talk a little bit about gravity. Maybe you wanna talk a little bit about air pressure. Hmm. Maybe you wanna talk a little about, well, we've talked about the food as far as life in space. Um, what's sleeping like in space? These are all things that we had to to, to uh, talk about, that we had to learn and experiment with, with the with the Mercury and the Gemini programs. What would it be like uh, if you went out into space without your spacesuit? Spacesuits are pretty important, and they had to wear them while they were inside their capsule for sure. Um, what would it be like? Uh, let's say. If you if you if if your tiny window on your space capsule cracked and and blew out and you got pulled out into space, what would happen? What would happen to all the water in your body? Here we have an experiment. Let me make it full screen for you. We're going to talk about just that. Here we have a bell jar, and inside that bell jar, you can see we have a little jar of water in there, right? Uh, the bell jar is connected to a vacuum pump. You can see the connection down there with the hose. And if we turn that vacuum on, it will remove all the air from the bell jar. And what will happen to the water? Okay, guys, maybe put down there in the chat. You can see the bell jar is, is firmly uh, resting on the table there. What do you think is gonna happen to that water as we turn on the vacuum and suck all that air right out of that bell jar? You got a good look at that water. By the way, guys, the water is at room temperature, okay? It's not any special, uh, we didn't heat it up, we didn't freeze it. Ooh, look at those bubbles that you see. You see bubbles come through there, don't you? It looks like the water is, is, is actually boiling. So if you were to get sucked out of your space capsule without your space suit on to protect you, the water in your body and human beings are about 60% water. So all that moisture on your body will start to boil, right? It'll start to, ex uh, to uh, uh, excrete out of your pores and other areas of your body, okay? So what's going on here is it's, it's all about air pressure. Here on Earth, we are surrounded by the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is exerting pressure on us, 14.7 PSI. That's, that's pounds per square inch on every square inch of our of our bodies. Okay, that square inch right there, 14.7 pounds is, and that might sound like a lot. I mean, just picture a weight 
on every square inch of your body that weighs almost 15 pounds. That might sound like a lot, but we have adapted to that. Human beings have adapted. That's our, that's our home environment. If you go up into space, you don't have that air pressure anymore. So these air molecules, which are used to having that weight on them as well, keeping them as a liquid, are going to say, hey, we can stretch out and we don't have to uh, be a liquid anymore. We can actually become a, a gas, which is water vapor. Okay, so that happens to water. That's what will happen to water and the liquid in your body should you get sucked out into space. What would happen if you know that you're getting sucked out into space? For example, would you take a big giant breath and hold it because you know you're not gonna have any air to breathe in? Would you blow all the air out of your lungs, okay, and get that all out? Let's try another experiment here with our bell jar. As you can see, we got two balloons in there. The red balloon has a little bit of air in it. The blue balloon has no air in it, effectively anyway, at all. So the red balloon is going to represent those of you who thought that you take a big breath in. The blue balloon is going to represent those of you who say that you should blow all the air out of your lungs. Okay, once again, mm, Sam is saying you'd explode other things, other ideas, just throw it down there in the chat. We got that blue balloon there that is representing empty lungs. Put that back on there. We're going to cover it up with the bell jar. And once again, we're going to connect that hose coming from the vacuum to that bell jar, and we're going to start to pump that air out. Let's check it out. What's going to happen to those balloons? As the air pressure gets less and less inside that bell jar, what do you see happening? That red balloon is getting bigger, isn't it? Well, the blue balloon's not really moving at all. So those of you who have determined that you should take a big deep breath because you're not going to have any air and you might last a little longer, imagine your lungs expanding like that. Your lungs actually may indeed reach their breaking point and may actually pop, right? So you wouldn't want that to happen either, right? Uh, so the, the correct answer here is you want to blow out all the, the air from your lungs and that, you know what, that's not going to make you survive the vacuum of space, but it may, like, it may make you uh, last a little bit longer, a little bit longer. And that's kind of cool when you disconnect the, the hose uh, from the vacuum and the, all the air rushes back in. So the, the balloons return to their original sizes. Also, while you're floating out, you've just gotten sucked out into the vacuum of space. What happens to your skin? And to represent your skin, we're going to put a marshmallow in the bell jar there. Attach that hose one more time. What do you think is going to happen to your skin real quick? Up, oh, it's happening there. We're going to suck that air out. And as the air pressure gets less and less on that marshmallow, you see it getting bigger. It's expanding, right? There's a lot of air inside a marshmallow. It's sugar. Uh, it's uh, all kinds of cool uh, um, things in there that make it taste good. But it's it's a lot of air inside there. So that's going to make it expand only to a point. And then what do you think is going to happen if someone, your best friend, pulls you back into your spacecraft? Let that air back in. Let me let me pause it and give you guys a chance to to uh, answer that question. What do you think is going to happen to that marshmallow? As the air pressure um, comes back to normal and that air rushes in the bell jar, any, guess, any guesses? Is it going to stay like it is now? Is it going to get even bigger maybe? Is it going to shrink down a little bit? Let's take a look. Let that air in. Ooh, ooh look at that. Look at the wrinkles. It, shrinked, uh, it, it shrunk all the way down. It shriveled up. That's going to happen to your skin too, guys, as all that, that air has already uh, escaped from that marshmallow. Right. Excellent. Um, this might be a good place to uh, stop and get our uh, take our third question break. If you guys have any questions, put them in the chat. Do astronauts have to wear a spacesuit in the capsules? Okay, excellent question. Um, I think I might have answered that before. While you're in your capsules, certainly in the early missions, in the Mercury missions, in the Gemini missions, you wanted to stay in your spacesuit. And that was actually one of the things they're going to experiment with, too. Can you take your helmets off? Can you breathe okay in the, in the uh, environment of your capsule? 
But as things got to the, the third leg in our race, the Apollo missions, they were actually able to, to uh, take their spacesuits off to be a little bit more comfortable uh, in transit. But absolutely for launches and for landings, they got to put those spacesuits back on just in case there's any malfunctions in their atmosphere environment or in their, um, uh, you, you know, with their, uh, uh, you know, with their breathable air and the air filtration system. Um, so by the time of Apollo, they were spending a lot of time out of the spacesuits and, and the shuttle program as well. And at the International Space Station, they don't need to wear those spacesuits while they're up there. Yeah. Uh, also, is there another question? No more questions. All righty then, we'll move on here, guys. Uh, so the United States has won the space race, okay, with the uh, moon landing uh, on Apollo. Um, in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, even as the Apollo programs were still going on, guys, the United States decided to take a different, uh, a, a different direction with their space program. Now they've won the race to the moon. The Soviets were having all kinds of problems getting there. The United States, uh, some people in the United States thought that they've, they've experimented with anything that they needed to. Uh, they didn't really need to go back to the moon anymore. There were other things going on in history that the United States government was involved in as well. So maybe uh, Congress didn't wanna spend a whole lot more money on the space program. But what they did wanna do is spend a lot more time in low earth orbit, okay? The area in space directly outside of the earth's atmosphere. Um, and if they could make something that was reusable, a reusable spacecraft, then that would be even better, all right? All right, let's say, let's go to our next, there you go. We are of course talking about uh, the space shuttle program. Um, the first one built is the Enterprise. And if you come here to the Intrepid, you'll be able to see the Enterprise that's on display uh, on the aft section, the rear of our flight deck in a space shuttle pavilion. You won't be able to miss it, big white building, right? Um, but I have to tell you that the Enterprise was the prototype. Being the test model, um, it never itself went into space. It does not make it any less important. It made it possible for all the other ones to go up into space, okay? Um, so it was, it was uh, just as important. The space shuttle being reusable was gonna be able to blast off like a rocket and land like an airplane on a runway, okay? So that was the whole idea behind the, the space shuttle. There's gonna be six different orbiters made, including the Enterprise was the first one. They're gonna uh, uh, serve 135 missions overall. The Enterprise in doing its testing is gonna go up in the atmosphere on, on the back of a 747, which is called the SCA, the Shuttle Carrier Aircraft, like you see in the picture here. Um, and five of those missions, it's gonna come up off the back of the 747. These are called ALTs, Approach and Landing Tests. And this is to test its ability to fly, glide, although it was a glider, unpowered, it still was flying, through the atmosphere and come to a landing uh, on a runway uh, like you saw before. The Enterprise will be retired by NASA in 1982. Um, it, it will get its first permanent home down at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, the Smithsonian Museum. Um, but when the discovery became available for them, the Enterprise became available for someone else, someone like the Intrepid Sierra and Space Museum. So they're gonna crane it onto the back of that SCA, the 747. They're gonna fly it up here to New York City. And before it lands, it's gonna do a, a couple of tours around the island of Manhattan, like you see here in the photo, before landing at JFK Airport. There, they're gonna crane it onto a barge. It's gonna sail up the Hudson River. It's gonna park right here alongside the Intrepid, where the world's largest seaborne crane is gonna crane it right off the barge, right onto the flight deck of the Intrepid, and the Space Shuttle Pavilion will be, um, will be built around it, okay? So the Space Shuttle Program overall will fly its last mission on July 21st, 2011. The Space Shuttle Program will be ended. But we kind of still wanna go into space, right? We had a lot of things to do. Um, we can thank the space shuttle program for doing things like building the International Space Station. 
for launching satellites. Many of the communication satellites we still use today and for GPS were launched by uh, shuttle missions. Uh, space telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, 350 miles away from the Earth's surface, and that's the furthest away the shuttle program ever went from where we all are right now. Uh, we have the shuttle program to thank for putting those in orbit and, and broadening our uh, understanding of the cosmos. But it was retired in 2011. What are we going to do? How are we going to go into space? We still want to go into space. We're going to have to partner with our former Cold War adversaries, folks. Uh, the Russians, right? The former Soviets, now the Russians. Okay, we're going to use their Soyuz rockets and their Soyuz uh, spacecraft to take our astronauts to and from places like the International Space Station. Uh, there would be some limited satellite uh, um, launchings as well. This is once again, a capsule and not reusable. So after the reusable stuff, we do go back to the one use only, one mission only uh, spacecraft. The front of it here on the left, that is the orbital module. That's the space that the astronauts are gonna ride up in. The back here in white, that is the service module. That basically just contains all the, uh, the CO2 scrubbers from the atmosphere and the electronics. But the middle section here in the, uh, in the black is the reentry module. Okay, so that is what the astronauts are gonna take a ride back down through the atmosphere, just like Scott Carpenter did, just like Gus Grissom and John Young did. Um, and if you come to the Intrepid, uh, you will see a space used flown craft. And that is what you're looking at now. That is a uh, used Soyuz reentry module that was actually used uh, to bring astronauts back into uh, uh, back into the atmosphere. Yeah, Apollo Soyuz uh, in 1975, I see your comment there, Sam. That was, uh, a lot of people consider that the actual ending of the space race with uh, Russian cosmonauts and American astronauts meeting and shaking hands in space as well. So I kind of consider that the end of the, sp the space race as well. Now, how many people go up in this in the uh, Soyuz capsules? Well, that's three as well, just like the Apollo uh, astronauts. Uh, look at all the room they have in there, okay? It's nice, comfy, and cozy. I hope you like the guy that you're that you're going up there with. Um, this is a, uh, uh, you can see them all smiling. I'm not sure how much smiling they did uh, when they were all cramped together coming home. Um, but don't worry, they're not gonna take too much of a, of a shock when they land. We're gonna get to how they land. Um, the seats that they're sitting in are made from memory foam, and they are custom made for each astronaut, okay? So if you go up, you're going to have a seat made just for you that I won't or anybody else won't be able to, 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 uh, to fit into or at least be comfortable in. That's going to add to your comfort. Right? But let's talk about how they do uh, uh, come uh, back to uh, the Earth. Do they have splashdowns like the Apollo, Gemini, and uh, Mercury programs? Or will they land somewhere else? Hmm maybe somewhere that's a little more solid. You got it, guys, okay? The, the Russian Soyuz rockets and missions do come down in the desert in Kazakhstan, okay? Um, and they do use parachutes as well, as you can see in the photos here. And as you can see in the, sh the shot there on the right, let me zoom in a little bit. When you get to about a height of only one meter, so a little more than three feet above the desert sands, it's got rockets on the bottom of it. Those rockets fire to slow you down one last time before you. I'm sorry about that, guys. I think uh, we're back. Okay, yeah, a little technical difficulties. Let's quick get my screen back up so we can keep talking about the presentation, which we're almost done and ready to take your questions anyway. Let's get that tab back up. There it is. 
Let's add it to the stream. I apologize, guys. There you go. Fantastic. All right. So I was talking about that uh, those ret those rockets that are going to fire when you get about uh, yeah retro boost when they get the when you get about a one meter a little more than three feet above the desert sands and before you take your 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 jolt when you hit the desert sands. Okay. And it's going to be quite a while before they're going to be able to get to you and open up that capsule because of the ionization the the, the, the ionized gas that's going to make your capsule really really hot. So now we've uh, talked about what we did in the past. We talk about how we're going into space now. Um, and of course, another way that we're going into space now is the commercial crew program. We've just uh, recently, a few months back, launched the first SpaceX crewed mission. So SpaceX, private industry. Um, and of course, just, a, just, a, uh, just this past Sunday, Richard Branson went up and Virgin Galactic. So now we are partnering with private industry as well to take astronauts and people up uh, into space, right? But what are we doing in the, in the future? NASA, just a couple of years ago, have uh, announced the Artemis program because we want to go back to the moon. We are going back to the moon. Yes, Sam, just like Blue Origin. I do see you there, Admiral, as well. Thanks for tuning in. Um, now, Apollo, also a Greek uh, from Greek mythology, he was a major god of the Greek pantheos, Panthenon. He had a twin sister named Artemis, and Artemis was the goddess of, of uh, agriculture and nature. So this has a distinct female bent to it because Artemis, uh, Artemis uh, project, which is going to begin later on this year, will carry four astronauts back to the moon. Uh, at least one of those will become the first woman on the moon, and at least one of those will become the first person of color to walk on the moon as well. Astronaut uh, uh, Artemis 1 is due to launch sometime near Thanksgiving, later in November this year. That will be a robotic, unmanned, uncrewed, mis uncrewed mission. That's the way we should say it. It's going to take the Orion capsule, more Greek mythology there, Orion the hunter, right? Uh, and it's going to put it in orbit around the moon and come back to the Earth. Artemis 2 will be um, a crewed mission which will carry those four astronauts once again in orbit around the moon and back to the earth. Artemis three will actually be the landing mission, okay? Scheduled to land uh, more astronauts on the moon. Guys, I wanna thank you guys uh, so much for um, uh, tuning in today. Any last questions that I could answer for you? Just throw them down there in the chat. After the Artemis program, the, the, uh, the idea is, of course, to use what we're going to learn now by going to the moon to move on to their red planet. Uh, that is Mars. We will be going there as well. No questions? All right, guys, thank you so much. I'm sorry about those technical difficulties we had. Uh, my computer kicked us off, but we got right back on. Um, you are living in a very uh, uh, exciting time to be uh, uh, looking at the space program and to be learning about it. I certainly think it is. Um, leave your comments, uh, click that link uh, in the chat there. Let us know what you thought of this program. Please do join us once again next Tuesday for our uh, in-depth look at the Apollo missions, including uh, with, a, with a spotlight on Apollo 11. Until then, guys, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time.